This episode of the podcast is being sponsored by Irish Dance Theatre, who are presenting their annual winter production, The Celtic Gift, at various venues in Colorado. For more information, please visit www.irishdancetheatre.com. My name is Martin Percival, and you are listening to the Irish Dance Podcast. Folk dance to phenomenon and beyond. Hi everyone, I'd like to introduce our guest today. I'm super excited. We have an author on the on the line at the moment. Uh, she's written a couple of novels for adults and a children's book. Um, I'd pl- love to welcome Angeline King. Let's just get started. We'll dive straight in. How did you get involved in Irish dance? Um, well, when I was little, uh, there was a little girl up around the corner from me who was going to Irish dance and um, she asked me one day if I wanted to go with her. So uh, that's how I got involved. <laughs> that's simple. great like yeah it is very simple There's, it's usually either siblings or friends you know that yeah. that get people involved which is great so um did you enjoy it yes um it was quite a big class in the town hall in the town where i live which is um larne in county antrim in northern ireland um so i got to one of the things i, I most enjoyed was watching the other dancers uh i wasn't a very good dancer myself but I still enjoyed learning the steps and I loved the music. Um, in those days, of course, in the 1980s, we had live music. We had a pianist. Um, one of the teachers played the piano while we were dancing. So it was quite a nice, nice time to go to dancing. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, that's kind of typical in the ballet world to have a pianist for for a class and everything but not for Irish dance I don't, I don't think I know I had my dance teacher her mother was a um, pianist and accordionist and we sometimes when she was there it was lovely to have live music in the class so you were very lucky to have that yeah I think at one stage it maybe did switch to record when I was a teenager um, <laughs> so it didn't last all the way through and certainly nowadays it would all be um, iPods and so on Oh, I know. I just uh, that just uh, sparked a memory for me when of uh, my teacher like rewinding the tape. Yeah, <laughs> no, they, they would still, give us a breather. They, they would still <laughs> use, um, you know, live musicians for the festivals. For, yes, um, of course. You know, for the the bigger festivals, the class festivals would probably tend to be more iPods. Um, but for the Larne Festival or any of the other um, festivals around the country, they would have a fiddler and a pianist. Lovely, lovely. Um, so who, who was it that you danced for? I danced for um, Marjorie Gardner. Um, she, she ran the Andrews School, which she opened in 1936, and she ran wow. it right up to the millennium, new millennium. Wow, fantastic. Fantastic. So you had some great, uh, great instruction. Yeah, she was um, old school. Um, a, a, someone I interviewed described her as a legend. She's kind of, uh, she was well known in the festival community. Okay, so that brings us on to the, so you wrote a book about the festival scene in Ireland. Um, is, is it, um, is it worldwide? Yeah, the book's available anywhere, um, so you can buy it in the US or Canada or Australia, wherever, online. No, I'm I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I meant to say I, I meant to say is the festival organisation worldwide? Um, the festival organisation is regional, so it's specific to Northern Ireland. Um, in fact, it's even more specific than that. If you look at a map of Northern Ireland, <laughs> right. it sort of runs from um, the east side of the of Loch Ness, so um, from well, the main centres years ago would have been from Coleraine down to Portadown, and um, uh, there was a lot of dance schools in County Antrim and County Down. So, what what sparked the um, the idea? Um, I know I bought the book, um, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'm very sorry, uh, but I will. I'm really excited to read it. But what sparked the interest in in the whole um, subject? 
I just thought the festival story was quite interesting, um, if you know a little bit about the background to Northern Ireland's history. So Northern Ireland went through a, a period of um, conflict from 1969 until around 1998. Um, and during that time, people were became quite divided, uh, especially in urban areas. So uh, in places like Belfast, uh, Catholics and Protestants began to sort of live apart um, from the 1970s. Um, not everywhere now, you know, was, um, certain areas in Belfast would have been quite mixed. Um, but I find the story of the festival quite interesting because this was a forum um, where Catholics and Protestants mixed together. And that's unusual because Irish cult- culture during the Troubles started to become something negative in the eyes of um, some people within the Protestant community. Um, people began to associate Irish culture with um, political movements. So, the, for example, nationalism, the, you know, the political movement of nationalism um, was kind of linked to Irish culture. So people began to um, profess themselves as British uh, or Northern Irish, but not necessarily Irish. Now, that's changed a little bit now. I think people have um, become a little bit more open to um, describing themselves as Irish if they're from the Protestant community. So I just find it fascinating that so many Protestants um, were involved in Irish dancing during this period. You know that the history of Irish dancing was that it was um, set up by the Gaelic League. And at one point, the Gaelic League did become quite nationalist. Um, and the FESH was the you know the, the forum for that message. Um, you know, the promotion of Irish culture and um, nationalist politics, um, almost in some cases as well. So uh, as particularly in the early days uh, of the festivals in the 1930s, you had quite a lot of Protestants attending these fish. So they weren't just dancing at the festivals, they were dancing at the fish as well. But I can explain the difference between fish and festivals if, if, that, if that's getting a little bit confusing. <laughs> yeah, we'll get on to that in a minute. I, I, I find the whole situation fascinating because, of course, I've been aware of festival. Um, my mum lives down on the southwest coast of Ireland. Um, and just, but over in the States, um, it's. I would say, well, I can't, you know, I'm not going to tar everyone with the same brush, but I would say that there's probably, um, you know, a, a, not even an ignorance, ignorance, but there's just people are unaware of other organisations in the Commission to start with. But with festival <coughs> being so regionally based and, um, yeah. you know, th- they're completely unaware of it. And I will say that probably, for the most part, um, Catholicism and Protestants um over in america is 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 not viewed as um as as divisive as it is um back home but um people aren't aware <laughs> that it that it's that the Pro- the protestants have been irish dancing so i think i just find i find the find the whole thing fascinating and i think what I think the key, which I, you know, I pick up on when you were talking about it, was just saying it's about the Irish culture, and Irish dance has been in Irish culture for generations. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I love it. So yes, if you wouldn't mind, then please ex- explain the difference between a festival and a fish. Well, just to go back in time, then um, the festival tradition is one of the oldest traditions of Irish dance, um, along with the Commission. Um, the first festival to add Irish dancing um, was in 1928. So during the 1920s, you had the the revival of um, folk culture in general. So you had people like Cecil, Cecil Sharp in England. Um, he travelled around America as well, recording um, you know folk dances and folk songs and so on. Um, so that that folk revival hit. Ulster and uh, as a result the, those who ran the musical festivals um, where children would go along you know and compete for um, musical instruments or choral speaking or um, choirs um, they decided to add uh, Irish folk dancing um, to the syllabus of those festivals and the first one took place in my hometown in Larne in 1928 and then Ballymena added Irish folk dancing in 1929 um, and so did Portadown in fact. So um, yeah it has quite a long history. Some people can you know trace their family back several generations right back to that first festival in 1928. Yeah amazing yeah. 
That's absolutely brilliant. So how how then did um, how then did the festival scene progress? Uh, so at one stage, festival dancers and fesh dancers danced together. So you would have had um, members of the commission um, sending their dancers to the festivals. Uh, and you would have had dancers who were primarily involved with the festivals sending their best dancers to the fesh. So at one point throughout the 1930s and 1940s, um, everyone danced together. There would have been very little difference in style. Right. There's a massive difference in style today, but at that point there was very little difference in style. There was maybe like um, there were regional differences perhaps, um, but it would have been quite subtle. Um, costumes um, would have changed from place to place, but. Um, today the costumes are dramatically different yes they are yes yeah um i and i that in the evolution that's what i find fascinating um is the evolution of festival and the evolution of the fesh you know because um they are very very different now yeah so from about 1949 um rules come into play which meant that the festival dancers were no longer allowed to attend the fesh um, and commission uh, clamped down a little bit. Um, there may have been political reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that someone, um, Joyce Ann McCafferty, has written a, a biography of Miss Mulholland, who was one of the dancers or one of the teachers, sorry, who sent pupils to both festivals and fish. And um, she shows some letters from commission to Miss Mulholland that indicated they weren't happy with her involvement in, you know, maybe using British symbolism or attending events with um, sure. British symbolism and so on. Yeah. So um, at one point, the festival dancers then were no longer allowed to attend the fish, um, but they kept dancing and they kept running their own regional, um, or sorry, local festivals. Um, what happened then was the fish was... Uh, the commission, sorry, was international from the beginning, yeah. and it it developed very rapidly. Um, you know, as people began to travel around the world, and um, the festival community remained really regional, and so change uh, didn't really come at all for quite a long time. I mean, the, the, the dancers became more sophisticated in their steps and um, choreography and so on throughout the period of the 20th century, but... If you look at a festival dancer today and look back at the old videos mm. of um, Fesh in the 1920s and 30s, you won't see that much difference. Right. Um, so festival dancers would still have the bended knee quite a lot of the time. They don't necessarily... They've started to lift their leg a little bit higher, but it's not a, a, as big a feature. Um, I think Fesh dancers from the off would get the leg right up over the head. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a very so, different style. It's actually, I've seen some video of festival dancing and it's absolutely beautiful. It's so elegant. It's 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 gorgeous. So, um, yeah, I, I, lo- I love it. Um, so it's very, it's very similar to the Gaelic League style. It's kind of yeah. ironic. The festival dancers weren't allowed to attend the fish anymore, but they've retained that, um, that style. Um, you know, things things do change. It's not exactly the way it used to be. No, um, of I've noticed some of the changes in the book from talking to um, some of the older people. I know people over at Yeti certainly have noticed changes in festival itself. But um, either the costumes are not that far off what they would have been right. uh, years ago. You know, they've <clears throat> years ago they would have had um, a linen dress with maybe a lace collar and cuff. Mm-hmm. And um, some of the festival dance schools still retain the latest collars and cuffs, although they maybe have a velvet dress and they maybe have machine embroidery. Some of them have um, the hand-stitched embroidery still as well. There's a school called Riley School and they've got a lovely green dress with collars, cuffs and um, hand-stitched embroidery. Wow. So it's nice, Beautiful. It's nice that some of the schools have retained that, you know. Yeah, so when you say that the um, festival dancers weren't allowed to go to the fesh, were the fesh dancers allowed to go to the festivals at that point? Or was it just they was, just decided no? <laughs> they did They did go um, in the beginning. Certainly yeah. there's a, a well-known dancer called Arthur Burns and he attended the festivals in the 1930s along with lots of other um, dancers uh, who whose teachers were registered with commission. Um yeah, no, I so, mean after the um, after the kind of after, the rules of, of forty nine. No, that from from a quite early stage, the 
um, commission dancers were actually discouraged from attending festivals. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so I've spoken to a few people who said that, you know, in the 1960s, when they attended the festivals, they were allowed to do so under the name of their primary school or secondary school, but they weren't allowed to do so under the name of their commission teacher because the commission wouldn't allow that. Wow. So, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. they were quite strict. Um, there was maybe reasons that I don't know for that, but uh, the oh, two yeah, moves sure. did sort of, you know, separate then after that. But to be honest with you, most people within the festival tradition would never really have heard of the fest tradition and vice versa. Right, right. And that's... At that time, yeah. everyone just saw the Irish dancers on TV and thought they were the same and no one really, you know, certainly as children, you wouldn't have known anything about governing bodies or anything. No. And I, that's what I find interesting because it's just, it's not really until like this day and age where we have a lot of access to information about other, mm-hmm. other dancers you know that we're starting to 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 become aware of of every every form of irish dance you know which i just think is amazing like is a you know i'm very proud to be an irish dancer um and it just the whole history and that is is brilliant so um you know every aspect of it needs to be looked at and and seen you know and have some uh Oh, presence, I suppose. Um, yeah, and what's interesting about this, about the festival, is that it has such a long history as well. You know, it's um, it's got those long links with the past. It's not a modern organisation. Neither is a, a governing body. Um, of course, we can never get festival. away from that, right? <laughs> yeah, um, well, the Festival Dance Teachers Association um, came together. Actually, my old dance teacher, Marjorie Gardner, was very instrumental in um, setting up Um, So it started up in 1971, which was kind of as a result of, um, you know, Ancogel separating from commission. Yeah. Because I think they saw maybe um, that it was better to set up some kind of formal organisation until that time. They'd sort of been um, working as a community, but with no collective body. Right. If that makes sense yeah, to the festival, yeah. the people who ran the festivals, they knew who to invite to the festivals and they knew which people would go and so on, but um, they didn't necessarily have a, a, a formal committee um, governing them. So some of the festival dance um, teachers joined that organisation, but lots of them didn't. Um, nowadays, more of them are involved. Some of them are still independent, but they would still see themselves as belonging to the festival tradition. Mm. So and that's where it's confusing. <laughs> yeah, no, it is absolutely, and, and and if they're not members of the teachers um, association, then um, and they're still attending festivals. Um, how how does how does that work in terms of the governance? Um, so it relates back to those musical festivals. Remember, I was saying that you had um, musical festivals which were made up of choirs and. Um, instrument uh, competitions yeah. and uh, d- folk dancing so those are open competitions and anyone's allowed to go to those yeah. competitions yeah. Um, so if you take Ballyclare Musical Festival for example um, you, you can enter Ballyclare Musical Festival without belonging to the FTDA FDTA <laughs> <laughs> if I can say it um, however um the Festival Dance Teachers Association run their own festivals, uh, which used to be called the Nine Glens Festivals. Um, and those festivals, you're, you have to belong to the organisation. Oh, okay, to I see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that they lead into the um, Ulster Championships for the Festival Dance Teachers Association. Right. Okay, that makes sense. But what I like about it is the fact that there are open platform so to speak um yeah. festivals that anybody is allowed to attend um yeah. I, I you know i personally have a bit of a um a grievance a grievance against um being restricted about dancing anywhere so um you know i i just i think uh, we should all be able to dance at, in a, any location as long as you follow the rules of the of the event yeah. of the event that is going it, on it would be know. interesting i don't know how it would work if someone came up with a, a festival that was open to all irish dancers just to see what would happen you know um, <laughs> i think all, <laughs> i think all our heads would explode <laughs> <laughs> the styles are so dramatically different now. i'm not sure how it would work but um it would be nice to see it would be it would be absolutely gorgeous to see and i would imagine that there are a lot of um 
uh, commission and cohort teachers and other organization teachers that would rise to the challenge of being able to to put some um, some dancers in a festival style on the stage do you know what i mean i, I just think you know if we if we opened up the opportunities for teachers they um they could you know they could find that they loved loved this style more than you know what we're doing yeah but, so. um yeah, well, some of the uh, festival dance schools actually do compete in the open fish um, organisations. Okay. So some of them belong to some of the modern fish organisations, and they compete in both festivals and fish. There's a few of them do that. So they have um, so Seven Towers School in Ballymena. Yes. It was one of it's probably the oldest of the festival schools, um, and they have the most beautiful purple dresses, very traditional. Um, so they dance in those lovely dresses um, during festival. But then they also belong to um, a fish organisation. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. And um, you know the girls would be in their wigs and their flamboyant costumes right. for those festivals. Yeah. For those fish. No, I was aware of that because when I taught in. Las Vegas for um, a few years and uh, I had a couple of dancers who were living there um, and they were um, they were festival dancers and of course they were, when they were in Vegas we didn't we don't have access to any festivals in America that I'm aware of um, and so you know they would dance uh, at the fish um, and I was always fascinated to know how it was when they were when they went back, you know, what, what, how they were accepted and, uh, you know, how reintroduced back into the festival scene. But they, they did great. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so some of these um, schools would switch back and forward between um, fish and festival. Not very many of them now, but um, I think more of them increasingly they're, they're doing that. Mm. I think it gives them a chance to travel across the border um, and, you know, to enter world championships within the specific organization um so they're meeting people maybe from all around the world whereas in the festivals um they're maybe slightly more limited but some people are very very um loyal to the festival movement and you know they're very grounded in it and uh, protective over it and they you know um I was at a, a culture night in Belfast recently and passed by one of the Irish dancing schools and um, the teacher was on the stage and she stood up and said, um, this is the festival tradition of Irish dancing. We don't wear wigs. We don't allow our children to wear a fake tan or makeup. And there was this huge roar from the crowd. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, very much supported what she was saying so um you know that particular school is obviously very committed to the festival movement and probably don't compete in both festival and fish yeah that, that's fascinating i mean i you know of course coming from a commission background i uh, it's just what what we're used to with the wigs and the tan yeah. and all of that stuff mm -hmm. um i would i would really i would really find it interesting to uh to mix the worlds, you know, but unfortunately, at the at, at the present time, with the present rules with commission, um, I can't speak for any other organisation. But with the, the rules of the commission, we're I'm as a, an adjudicator, I'm not allowed to judge any other organisation only than commission. So, um, so I would imagine that the same goes for being able to compete with the students and that kind of thing. So, it's a it's a pity. It's a real pity in my mind. But uh, so. Then, like, let's talk a little bit about the uh, because I think this is the important thing is that when you were talking and from what I've read is that um, the having Catholics and Protestants in the same room learning Irish dance is amazing to me, especially during the Troubles. Yeah, it, I think it was. Um, no, there were lots of organisations where Catholics and Protestants would mix. For example, sports and swimming. Uh, boxing, you know, there, there are other arenas where Catholics and Protestants came together in a very close way. Um, however, this one's unique because it's Irish dancing and it has that yes. brand. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> Irish brand. And it's also unique because um, of the historical significance of, you know, the the Gaelic League at one point getting uh, becoming so nationalist and so on. So now there were some parents who didn't allow their children to do Irish dancing. I've recorded a few of those stories in the book. Mm. Um, and there are some examples of children wandering into Irish dancing um, schools by themselves. 
um, June Betts uh, is one of the dance teachers from Carrick Fergus. Um, so she began teaching with commission or learning with commission. She wandered into a school by herself when she was a little girl uh, in Carrick Fergus, which would be a predominantly unionist and Protestant town. And um, she just started dancing, and her family were quite surprised, but you know they accepted it and supported her. Um, some of the, some families maybe weren't so supportive um, in the beginning and were quite surprised. Uh, so I've recorded some stories of um, uh, one lady whose granny disapproved and made it clear that she disapproved. <laughs> <laughs> Always the granny, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I've... It's a, it is a fascinating history. And I remember when was I was at university from like 93 to 96. And, um, when I went away there, I, I was, um, I, you know, of course you join groups and this, that, and the other. And we had a, like an Irish culture group and I met a couple of uh, people there and I had people in the, um, the halls of residence that I was in that were Irish dancers. And I found it fascinating that the, one of the girls was, she was almost reticent to tell me that she was an Irish dancer because I was clearly, um, a commission, uh, dancer from what she'd seen, um, because we got up and did a step about, you know, and, um, but she, ha- she was, um, a Protestant. And so it was always, it was like, I, you know, I, renou- I renounced my um, religion at the age of 12, but, um, you know, we were brought up Catholic. Um, so, you know, it, it just kind of went hand in hand. And so she was, she was almost scared to tell me that she was an Irish dancer and that, and that she was Protestant. Do you know what I mean? Oh, that's unusual. Usually people would be very proud of, um, you know, if they've taken part in Irish dancing, particularly if they're Protestants, they almost want to defy um yeah which i think is great yeah (laughs) separately you know it's something that um protestants are very proud of they've got a very uh, rich heritage of irish dance and we have quite a lot of um all ireland champions who started off with uh, when festival and fesh dancers mixed together um quite a few of the the people from this area would have been all ireland champions Mm. Um, a lot of the mulholland dancer dancers were all ireland champions um, Miss Mulholland is probably the most famous person in the festival community. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of people would believe that um, Miss Mulholland's style of dancing um, is the style that became festival, mm. you know. Um, because it's it, so it's balletic yeah. and that kind of thing. She was famous for that, her Irish ballets and yeah. stuff, yeah. Well, the Irish ballet, so um, I think sometimes there's... A, a perception that the Irish ballets must have had something to do with classical ballet, but I think the way the word ballet used to be used, um, it was just really a theatrical presentation of dance, right. not necessarily yeah. uh, classical ballet. So she was teaching Irish dancing, and she had been trained by, you know, she was trained by Mr. O'Rafferty before commission was formed. Uh, but you know what I mean? She, she came from the fesh background herself. Um, I think that some of the theatrical elements of her dancing when she was doing the ballets um, would certainly have um, come through. And even today, when you see her dancers on stage, I think they still have that little um, bit of drama um, and, you know, theatrical expression that you maybe wouldn't find elsewhere. Well, that and that's probably why I find it so fascinating is because my background, because I'm now running a company, an Irish dance theatre company, Uh and... I just, you know, I just think that at some point we all get trained to dance and whichever way you come in the door, so to speak. But if you're going on to perform, um, then, you know, it doesn't matter where you've been trained. It doesn't matter how, uh, w- what organization you come from. Um, when you perform, you're telling a story. So yeah. that's what that's what I find fascinating because I do think Irish dance is so expressive and it uh, it lends itself really well, especially having hard and soft shoe, it lends itself really well to um, storytelling. And of course, as Irish people, we're we're always telling stories you know um it's it's one of the things that we're really good at um especially yourself as an author of course um and so that's why i just this whole subject i find fascinating because it's uh I, i don't know i just think it's another um it's just another expression of of the of the irish dance culture and community and one that's can be more 
well, I wouldn't say more readily accept, accepted as a performance, um, but I know when you when you're talking about Miss um, Mulholland that uh, she's very well known for the performance aspect. Yeah, and right from the beginning, um, from the 1920s. Um, through the 1930s, those and, and, and the 1940s as well, the, the theatrical side of things was really, really important. Um, the competitions were probably, you know, um, just something that you did once a year, or you, maybe if you were one of the good dancers, you would have gone to quite a few of the festivals around the country. But um, the variety performances were very important, and a lot of the de- teachers would have raised funds. Um, through the variety performances so I know that my own teacher um, she was called Miss Andrews back then she ran a variety performance in 1942 I think it was during the war Um, the festival had closed down at that time because the NAFI had occupied the Victoria Orange Hall Um, and so she ran a variety performance in the town hall and 200 people had to be turned away you know these were really popular um, performances Mm. um so right across all the teachers, um, everyone I've spoken to has said to me, my teacher was running Riverdance style performances way before Riverdance, you know, so that, that's been an important part of the festival tradition, probably the fest, fest tradition as well. Um, I know that Anna McCoy from the fest tradition in Belfast yes. was also, yeah. um, uh, you would have put on theatre performances in Belfast, but certainly it would have been a very important part. It's maybe less important today. Um, but there's still a yeah, few schools. There's you know a few schools that would still um, carry out those theatrical performances. I spoke to Lochiel School, which is the largest festival school. They have 160 pupils, and they would put on a lot of these um, theatric theatrical performances based on uh, you know Gaelic myths or Celtic myths. Um, and also the Balnafai School in Belfast. Um, they're from the other side of town, from Miss Mulholland, and they just um, put on a big show in the waterfront this year. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, you know, it's still alive. It's maybe not as um, prevalent as what it was before. But when they do it nowadays, I think they go for it in a big way because oh, yeah. you know, one of the things that's happening in Northern Ireland right now, there's a lot of change and, you know, for the first time for a long time we've now got a, a booming tourist industry and when the tourists come to Northern Ireland now they want to see Irish culture they want to see Irish dancing um, so you know it's, it's something that's really taking off all those cabaret performances and so on are, are very important now yeah and I think it's hugely important that the, the, that um, that flavour so to speak, of Irish dance needs to uh, retain. We need to retain that. Um, I know that f- my own agenda for Irish dance theatre is is to dig into those roots. You know, so I it just it's just absolutely gorgeous to me that um, that we do have this um, this dance form that can be so different. And yet we could all do it if we, if we, um, you know, put our mind to it. Absolutely. I mean, the, the fesh dancing that I see now, I, I'm not an expert on dancing, by the way. <laughs> I should say that. But <laughs> I, I can observe and see things. And um, I was at the uh, Oma Folk Park the other day launching my book and saw some fesh dancers there. The dancing is extremely sophisticated. You know, I could never have done anything that, like that at the age that these little girls are dancing at. You know, they were maybe... Um, seven or eight years old and the things they were doing with their feet <laughs> was just extraordinary yeah. for me so mm-hmm. uh, you know for them to to learn that festival style I'm sure would be um feasible you know if they change their, their style and so on so I'm sure people can move between both styles quite easily that the style of dancing that my little girl learns is exactly the same as um the dancing that I did when I was wee uh, yeah. Her is exactly the same. It's the you know the big round circle of sevens and the side or sorry the big round circle of one two threes and then the sideways sevens and it's it, there's yeah. no part tricks <laughs> along the way. It's exactly the way I learned it. Exact same steps. So it's very historical. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And but that I mean, even from a commission dancer, that that was how I I learned. That was how you know I started my journey yeah. with, um, with you know with the. You know, they're the the what I would call the basics, you know. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it is. It is. I I really do think that the, the 
even though it looks like we're worlds apart at the moment, I don't think we are. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and which is which is a, a, um, just beautiful. So let's talk a little bit about your book then. Um, it's available worldwide. I, I bought my copy on Amazon. So, um, mm-hmm. but is there a some somewhere specific you would like people to go to to find it? Mm-hmm. Um, well, for worldwide sales, Amazon's probably the easiest place to go. Um, you can also go to the publisher's website. Um, so the, the details are on my Facebook page if anyone wants to check those out. Pardon the interruption. I just would like to make a little uh, small announcement. Uh, We are happy to announce that we will be giving away a copy of Angeline's book on Instagram and one on Facebook starting tomorrow, Wednesday, October 31st, 2018. Um, For more information um, and how you you can enter to win, follow us now on uh, Instagram at Irish Dance Podcast and on Facebook uh, forward slash Irish Dance Podcast. Good luck, everyone. Okay, I'll put a link in the show notes. Yep, for that. So, um, yeah. So, um, how has the book? Uh, you only launched when? Just a little while ago, right? On Thursday, officially. Yeah. Oh right. Just. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, um, how has has the reception been? Well, the Belfast Telegraph article has been something else altogether I didn't expect the reaction at all and a lot of people have contacted me just to thank me for um telling the story of the problem to Irish dance it's funny though a lot of people are thanking me for something that happened in the past when they maybe don't realize that it's still ongoing it's never stopped it's always been important in in Protestant communities um, yes. So I've had a lot of thank yous from people who said, oh, my sister used to dance in Bellamina in the 1950s and whatever. Um, I've had a, a lot of uh, reaction. There, there's a lady called Linda Irvine who is quite well known in Northern Ireland at the minute because she runs um, Irish classes in East Belfast in an area that um, is predominantly Protestant. And um, she's changed a lot of perceptions about the Irish language. She actually came to Lauren and helped me set up an Irish language class as well. So Irish language, just for people who maybe aren't aware of the intricacies of culture here, um, there's a lot of controversy about the Irish language at the moment um, because it's been politicised, I suppose. It's been used as a almost like a political weapon by um, lots of people in the country. And um, I suppose Linda Irvine has done a great job of just um, taking that all away and talking about the language and how important it is. And she saw the article in the Belfast Telegraph and shared it. And she's got quite a a wide following of people who are interested in um, erasing these stereotypes of culture and She's got a, a large following of people who enjoy hearing stories about our shared culture and what brings us together rather than what divides us. And so I got a lot of reaction from um, those people, from Linda Irvine's followers as well. So there's a lot of, you know, it's sort of representative of all the change that's happening in Northern Ireland now as people come closer together. And I suppose that reflects what actually happened in the 1920s and 30s. You know, there was the War of Independence, there was a lot of sectarianism after that, and then people gradually came together and Irish folk dancing was promoted during that period by um, some of the, you know, wealthy unionists who ran these festival, uh, these musical festival associations, um, because they probably felt it was important to retain these links with Irish culture as, as the country became partitioned. Uh, so I sort of feel like... Um, we're at that stage of history again where people are pulling together and the book just came at the right time, I think, because um, people are interested in that story rather than, I think people are bored of hearing how we're divided, you know. Yes, and um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, just speaking from being in America at the moment, it's uh, there's a, a very huge political divide here. Um but you know nothing in in comparison to the troubles or anything but it it just it just reminds me that um yes we we need to celebrate <laughs> what we're uh, 
what we have in common, not what. Yeah, I, so I do think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I found out about it through the Belfast Telegraph yeah. um, article um, on Facebook. Somebody else, some some commissioned teachers um, had shared it, and yeah, so I saw a, that. So and I, I'm actually really pleased by the reaction from um, the commissioned teachers because they've really taken an interest in this story. Um, so, uh, you know, that's fantastic. I, I was really pleased with that. Um, just in terms of America... Uh, I go a little bit further back in the book than the Gaelic Revival. So I look at dancing habits in Ulster in the 1800s. And you maybe have seen that I mentioned in the Belfast Telegraph article, there's a very good reason why Protestants are, you know, or were sort of interested in Irish dancing in the 1920s during that folk dancing revival. And that's that they had been dancing all along. Right, So the Gaelic Gaelic, um, almost rebranded. Um, dancing so that they could create a, a national dance which was you know it's a great idea because if they hadn't done it at the time um, you probably wouldn't have had this big explosion of um, Irish dancing and it wouldn't have become maybe the important thing that it has today um, so during the rebranding process however I think some um, you know people forgot maybe that Protestants had been dancing all along, that it was called step dancing during the 1800s. The solo dancing was called step dancing and the, the Cayley dances um, would have just been called country dances. And that term is actually still used within the festival tradition right up until the 1970s. If you look at the 1970s programmes for festivals, they would have still have had a country dance section. Um, so the, the word Cayley dancing didn't really catch on so much in the festival world. Um, but and there are American links as well. Um, I looked at dancing habits in you know the Appalachian area, uh, right. where Ulster Scots um, people would have travelled in the 1600s and 1700s, and even in the 1800s as well. And um, some of those uh, dancing habits there reflect you know the the tradition that we see today in Irish dancing. If you look at any of those. Um, videos that are online um, of the the dancers from that area. It almost looks like river dance. You know, there, there's um, a series of videos called the Hoffman videos that were made in the 1960s, and they would have had dancers from the who were maybe trained in the late 1800s. Same okay. as in Irish dancing. It's just the style is a lot more rustic because it hadn't had that sort of middle class. Um, you know, uh, addition of decorum um, that the Gaelic League brought. So, you know, that this story is relevant not just for um, Irish people in America, but also for those people from um, the you know the areas that were settled by the Ulster Scots as well. Wow, it's fascinating. Like when you trace it all back, it, it's just it is amazing. It's amazing what this dance form, where it's where it's come from, and um, so. The thinking about that, then, that if we change the trajectory, look, where we're going forward, what, where do you think, um, where do you think the evolution of festival is going? Well, I can't really speak for um, you know the, the festival tradition itself. There are people a lot more qualified than me who are who belong <laughs> to the, the Festival Dance Teachers Association. Of course, yeah. I would personally love to see it go global. Um, I would love. Yes, I, I would love too. To see yeah. um, some organisations set up in places like America, and especially like there's a huge link between Canada and Ulster. A lot of people from. Um, this area of Ulster where I live went over to Canada to live and set up yeah. so a big yeah. part of the story is that Canadian Ulster link especially from the Ballymena area um, it would be lovely to see some festival schools in other areas I have no idea how that would work at an organisational level I don't really know how that I don't know the ins and outs of the workings of the Festival Dance Teachers Association but um, even if there was a an attempt at the style I know that last year I know that a couple of dance teachers um, went over uh, from you know the festival tradition um, there was a lady from Portadown Deborah Anderson and um, her friend Elizabeth from um Seven Tower School both went to America quite recently to teach the festival style. So I know that there are already attempts to, um, you know, look outwards. I, I don't know much more than that, though, you know, uh, if there's like a, an attempt at an organisational level to reach out. But even if some of the schools would, um, I think it would be lovely if they adopted the style of costume. 
um, you know, I, I really love the festival style of costume, and I think that, it, I, you know, it, the the dresses have um, been fairly consistent since the 1930s, and it's nice to you know keep that that tradition alive. Um, obviously, those same dresses were used in America and you know England and right. yeah. up, up until quite recently, and. I'm probably going backwards in time here, but it would be so lovely to see um, a return to some of those traditions. How do you feel about that, Martin? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that I think there's definitely a place for it, and I think that the, there are, would be some interest, most definitely. We, uh, we have our very own Sally Houston. She's from Ballymena, and she, um, I mean, she's in Canada, and she teaches up there, been commissioned for years because she has emigrated there. But... Um, you know, I'd love to get her take on on the whole because she danced with Seven Towers. I'd love to get the whole her whole take on the whole thing. Well, you you but can read about it, her whole take on the whole thing in the book. There's a section on Sally Houston. Excellent. Yes, good. <laughs> I don't know what Sally. her take is actually excellent. on what you ask, but there is a section on Sally Houston in the book. <laughs> Yeah, no, but I'm I'm interested, which is which is fabulous. But I'm interested in what um, you know if if there was to be perhaps um, some interest or some you know for the festival tradition over here in the states that um, just how it would look. It's just it's fascinating. So I'm obviously there's nothing I'm going to take on on my plate, but um, I would love to see it. I would absolutely love to see it. Well, there's another bit, an important family. Um, with regard to the history of dancing in Ballymena, where Sally is from, um, the McConnell family would have been um, instrumental in that area in the same way that Miss Mulholland was around the same time mm. that it's actually Miss Mulholland, Patricia Mulholland's sister Stella had originally set up the, the class and um, Patricia was helping her. But then the McConnells in Ballymena would have been very important in those early stages, particularly um, there was a lady called Agnes McConnell and her whole family um, were involved in some respect in Irish dancing and her brother Sam moved to Winnipeg in Canada in 1942, I think, and um, he continued dancing over there and he set up his own dancing school and the Ballymena people used to travel back and forward to, you know, share the latest um, techniques and so on with him. That um, Sadie Bell, Sadie Bell made that trip. Um, a few other people, actually from the the Larne and Ballymena area, um, made that trip with Sadie. Uh, so the McConnell family still have a dancing school in um, Canada, and they've been really supportive. Um, the Ulster, sorry, the um, Ulster Folk and Transport Museum had run a. Um, an exhibition of Irish dancing a few years ago and it's moved now to the um, Ulster American Folk Park so they contacted me because they were quite interested to find out if there were any you know um, transatlantic stories mm. and I told them about the McConnells and then when I went there um, on Saturday for the book launch they had a, a lovely big wall um, all about the McConnells um, travelling across wow. and setting down school there so you know, um, the McConnell family have been so supportive and provided me with so much information. Uh, so it, it's, you know, there's that link as well. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait to read the book, actually. Um, yeah, no, I, I can't. It, it, There's probably no surprises now. Probably given, it <laughs> given it all away. Yeah, no, but it's, um, you know, I, I, I'm... I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So, um, but thank you for sharing every all of your knowledge. It's it's absolutely, um, you know, mind blowing to me. Um, all of this. I can't wait to hear the podcast so I can hear what I sound like <laughs> <laughs> with my big Lauren accent on radio. <laughs> no, you sound great. So you've written two novels for adults and one children's story. Yeah. Right. Um, Okay, um, I'll put the in the show notes what they're what they're called. But do you want to briefly talk about how how that all came about? Um, well, I was at a work conference uh, in Australia, and I heard a very inspirational talk from a couple of people from America, and I was supposed to be there. Um, 
promoting the software from the IT company I was working for at the time, but I find the speech is so inspirational, this idea of setting a goal and writing it down. And I'd always wanted to write a novel, so I wrote the goal down, and then I came back home and started writing. Um, I'd already written half a novel, and I um, went back to it. It was you know, a good 10-year gap. So I finished that one and knew it wasn't really going to do anything for me, but it led straight into the next one, which was A Belfast Tale, which I've published. Um, a Belfast Tale is actually set during the Troubles. Uh, it's a transatlantic story. So um, someone from Northern Ireland falls in love with um, someone from America. It's set against the backdrop of um, the Troubles. Uh, during that period, we used to have children who went over to America on a programme called Project Children. So lots of Irish children used to travel across um, to America during the summer. Mm. Thousands, yeah. in fact, and they stayed with American families. Uh, and so I had participated in an adult version of that programme, which is now called the Washington Ireland Programme, when I was a student. And I looked after the Project Children when they came over to America, and that inspired me to write a Belfast tale because um, I was interested just to you know, uh, to, to set that as the backdrop to the story. Um, so the American um, guy in the story is uh, one of the Project Children um, volunteers. He takes in a child um, from Belfast. So that was um, a Belfast tale. And then uh, straight after I wrote it, I got stuck into Snugville Street, uh, which mm. um, was the most successful of the two. Um, Snugville Street is another exchange in, in a sense. Um, it's a, an exchange between France and um, Belfast. So I had studied French and lived in France and um, I was always intrigued by um, perceptions of Northern Ireland from outside Northern Ireland. Uh, and so we've got this French guy who comes to stay in the Shankill area of Belfast which is um, a real Protestant heartland. Um, and, you know, he comes to find Ireland and is basically he lands in the most British part of Ireland. <laughs> so there's um, Snugville Street. There's a lot of comedy in it and also a lot of sadness. It's set after the Troubles, so it's a post-conflict novel. Uh, but um, it struck a chord and um, it was quite popular here in Northern Ireland. And I also had some Americans read it who loved it as well. And both of the, these are available online as well? Um, yes, they're both available on Kindle and um, in paperback. Excellent, excellent. And what about your... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so we've... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that was a little side. <laughs> My brain fried as <laughs> That's well. Okay. Sorry. The, that was a little side project. I had been writing some blogs on my website, and um, I was writing these little stories about my childhood. So they were fiction, but they were kind of based on my own childhood. And I wrote this wee story called "The Bully Up the Bray," and I wrote it in my local dialect. Um, some people call it a language, some people call it a dialect. I'm happy to call it either, um, and that's Ulster Scots. Um, so when we went to school, we sort of um, learned to speak standard English. But when we were children, we would have probably spoken quite a broad um, Ulster Scots. And so I wrote the story uh, in my childhood dialect as such. And it's just so many people read it online and laughed and thought it was funny. And then I wrote another one. Of course. And another one. And then uh, quite a few people said to me, uh, see those novels you're writing I don't really need read novels is there any chance of you publishing the wee children's stories <laughs> so um, <laughs> you know uh, I published them um, got an illustrator to do these beautiful illustrations again they're very much cross community stories um, I like the I, I love all the sort of um, shared elements of our, of our culture there's a few surprises in there you have um we have a bandstick competition. Bandstick competitions would be sort of part of um, Protestant culture. Years ago, the, the children would have um, made their little red, white and blue bandsticks in preparation for the 12th and then had competitions to see who could um, throw them the highest. So, of course, uh, the wee Catholic boy is the best at the bandstick in this story. <laughs> so, Excellent. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of fun with those stories. And the kids, when I go into school, they love them because they say I talk like their granny because their grannies are the only people <laughs> that you know, so many people just speak a very standard English. Um, my children don't really have a strong uh, Ulster dialect at all. 
so um, yeah, that, that was a little fun project that brought a lot of smiles. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, it sounds it sounds it sounds great. Um, so, what's in store for you in the future? Well, this um, Irish dancing book uh, was actually a bit of an accident. I got sidetracked. I was in the middle of writing a novel. <laughs> I was writing my first historic novel, um, which was set in the nineteen forties um, in post-war Northern Ireland, and. Um, I suppose it was quite handy because I wasn't sure how it was going to end. Uh, so it was quite nice to have this disruption to give me six months to think about how it was going to end. Uh, I was actually writing both the Irish dancing book and the novel at the same time at one point, And then I had to go back. Um, I had to get a full time job uh, again. And um, I concentrated at that point on the Irish dancing. So it's nice now to have the time, hopefully, um, if this book doesn't keep me too busy, to go back to that novel and finish it. Yeah, no, that's br- brilliant. Well, I wish you the best of luck with all of that. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I can't wait for all of the listeners to um, to to get the um, to get your book and actually any of them, but specifically the Irish Dance Festival one, um, and see and just see what what conversations can happen. After. Yeah, and it does cover the fish, um, the history of fish in Northern Ireland too. Um, so I don't go into it in as much depth because. Um, I really wanted to, uh, you know, concentrate on the festival tradition. Yeah. Uh, and because there's not very much written on the festival tradition as well, that was, you know, it was important to try and get uh, recordings of those stories now um, before it's too late. That You know, I've, a couple of people who appear in the book actually died in the last year. Um, there was a teacher, yeah. Yvonne Hood um, McKinley, so she unfortunately didn't get to see the book. Um, she passed away and she was you know, a great cross community heroine as well. And, um, she died in May. I didn't get to meet her. Um, and then, uh, a lady called Jean Tennant from Balamani. She just passed away there about a week before the book came out. So that was mm-hmm. very sad. So, you know, it's important that the stories are recorded, you know, a lot it is important. I completely agree. I completely agree. I, um, I think, you know, for the fish, tradition as well we need to get our stories down somebody needs to yeah that's what i i (laughs) think that um if people could take the bare bones of what i have on the fish story um in ulster and you know if there was someone out there who could go out and write a full book on um you know the the information i've got here there's and, and get around all those fish teachers and speak to them i would love to take it on myself but i think i've just come to the end of this project and (laughs) <laughs> you're like enough just, Irish dance for right there, now there are people who are better placed to tell that story because they know the teachers and they know the communities and they, they can access that information I found it really easy to access um, information because I had so many links within the festival community and I was able to yeah. navigate that community quite easily so yeah I definitely think there's room for another book on the fish story um, so we did, there is one um, more section that I usually do, and it's uh, just a, a rapid fire question section. Um, so just answer as as obviously as you see fit. Um, yeah. So can I just warn you, my brain at this time of night maybe isn't as rapid as what it should no, be. No. So let's see how we go. <laughs> You'll be fine. I usually I usually have to edit these quite a lot <laughs> because okay. you know people have to take time to think um okay so what is your favorite food uh, oh my goodness why can i not think of one single thing <laughs> uh, that, that's hard <laughs> <laughs> fish fish there you fish. go um, river dance or lord of the dance river dance what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given um Try to fulfill your goal today. That's very specific. <laughs> no, that's great. I love that. Um, is there a book that has changed your life? There's a book that I love called Anna Karenina. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I suppose it, yeah. This is quick fire, so I'm not allowed to give you details. On why. <laughs> <laughs> but, why, but you can tell me why it, why it influenced you. I think you. It, it just, it was so powerful and... Um, I suppose it led straight into the novel writing. You know, I, I started writing soon after that. Very important question, this one. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, what would you say then, um, 
would be if you were to give one piece of advice to um, either a young dancer or a young writer um, for, you know, words of wisdom from you. Uh, Words of wisdom for a dancer would just be to enjoy it, enjoy the music as well as the dancing. Yes, love that, love that. People sometimes forget about the music. (laughs) Yeah, you're quite right about that. (laughs) Um, unfortunately, yeah, uh, it was always, um, I, you know, coming from a teacher who was very musical, it was always very important to me. Um, you start with the music. Yeah, absolutely. And how about for any upcoming writers? Um, upcoming writers who want to start out writing, I would, um, recommend writing a diary to start with to get the thoughts flowing. Some great advice there from Angeline. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Irish Dance Podcast. Please follow us on social media and um, leave a review on iTunes if you would like. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye-bye.